So hi, Dr. Koss. Thank you for joining me for this supplemental Q&A session. So I know that you wanted to touch more on interventions used with um, individuals who suffer from opioid use disorder. So I'm going to let you jump into that. And then I have two additional questions from the audience. That sounds great. So first of all, thank you for having me back here. And thank you for the other day to be able to talk. I know I talked pretty much on some of the ways we assess and what can happen. But I do want to say that if you are working with someone there who either hasn't started any treatment for opioid use disorder or who has, there's a lot of actually evidence-based tools and also best fit culturally appropriate tools that you can use for people to help out. A lot of times when someone's early on, using the basics of motivational interviewing, identifying goals and values, and really trying to identify what does someone want right now and what might they want a little bit down the road can help deal with things such as pre-contemplation or ambivalence or just not knowing how to connect to some of the resources that can bring up what the needs are. And then you can work with that person to help them take whatever the next step might be, whether it's to think about treatment, whether it's leaving with Narcan, whether it is you know, actually trying to then make the steps towards treatment. So I just wanna stress that part pre-treatment wise. When it comes to treatment, especially if you're in an integrated care setting, one thing I would really encourage you to be at the table about is that for anyone who is receiving any sort of medication assisted treatment, that you be able to check in with them. It can be very helpful just to ask some questions about how are they doing? How is their recovery going? Have they been feeling any sorts of cravings? Have they come into any near high risk sort of situations? You know, that can be really useful as well as looking at things like we talked about the other day, depression, anxiety, uh, other concerns related to overall well-being, that those might be potential risk factors to address. So you can use some of those evidence-based tools like cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance commitment therapy, solution-focused therapy, or things that are going to be more tailored to the individual. And likewise, I find that there's a lot of CBT techniques that work on relapse prevention, um, such as being able to say an assertive no. You know, it's one thing that's often overlooked, but if someone's offered drugs, especially if it's caught at the wrong moment, they can have that, that temptation to say, yeah. So actually practicing saying no, and how would you decline an offer from a friend or someone they might know, as well as doing things like uh, risk identification. What are your risk factors? What are the things that can be triggers for you? And how might they come in your life? What might you do if you have a trigger? Who could you turn? What can you call to? I always find the best prevention is walking through what you might do in a risky situation so that then you're able to respond when it does come up, as well as just identifying different thoughts, feelings, and things that come up around use that someone may want to work on still. And then you can kind of go to your default modes of therapy. There's a lot you can do by checking in with someone who's early in recovery or even sporadically while they're still in that kind of established recovery just to see how they're doing and maintaining it. Okay, thank you so much for expanding on those. So that actually segues into the first question, and that is, do you know of any research about the effectiveness of treatment of an individual with OUD in a general mental health setting? I've had experiences with many clients who are not yet ready to stop their substance use, but want general mental health services for anxiety, depression, trauma, and aren't able to access them due to their substance use. Yeah, I think if I elaborate further on, I think the root of that question is something I've experienced often. A lot of mental health programs, they operate in silos. You have substance use over here, you have mental health here, and your primary care is in between. And you're like, I'm trying to get this person care, but you refer to the local mental health center or the private practice and like, sorry, you've used substances in the last three months. I can't help you. And they're like, yeah, I have. I have trauma. I'm trying to manage that or depression. And then likewise, on this side, you refer to a substance use center. And some programs are getting a lot better with this but it may not be fully dual diagnosis. So it's not addressing the trauma or the anxiety. So that person is going through withdrawal or medication assisted treatment, and then they're faced with the full brunt of their anxiety and trauma, which then often can lead them to drop out of treatment, maybe go relapse. It can, it can affect things in a lot of different ways, or you know maybe they have to snooze actually dealing with that anxiety and getting that help later. Um, these are all things I've run into in a million different forms, but the same sort of story. So I think it's very important that really, I always go back to Maslow's like hierarchy of needs, just thinking about what strengths does someone bring to the table? 
what is their biggest need right now? Are, are they hungry or are they thirsty for something? Do they not have a roof over their head? Do, are they looking for any kind of social support? I often start there first to try to take care of as many of the basics as we can do. And then I start to have these conversations of, I'm glad to give you some basic coping skills to try to help because what you might do to cope with anxiety is kind of similar to what you're going to need to do to cope with any sort of quitting, whether it's quitting smoking to something more intense like opioid use disorder. So that may be a place where I start. And then especially being in an integrated care situation, you get the full view. So you're seeing that big picture. So if someone is going, let's say to a substance use care facility and they're not necessarily being able to address the anxiety, is that a thing where you could maybe talk to someone either in the primary care team or the substance use team to maybe see if a medication can at least help in the short term for managing anxiety? Or maybe there's a way to do some just basic skills that you could have someone leave with or an app to manage anxiety until they feel like they can be a, in a position to, to better address that anxiety later on in a formal way. Or there may be some advocacy you can do to say, I know your approach is very much a 12 steps model or a peer support model. However, I really think you wanna look at and talk to this person you know, with releases of information and everything that I think there, there's really some anxiety-based things that could use some focus too. Is there any way we can include that in your care? Or is there any way I can do some things from primary care just very limited in scope to help out with that part, to keep them in your care and support you? Sometimes there's big brick walls where it isn't allowed with insurance or other things, but other times there are some rooms to negotiate or lobby and maybe to get maybe them in a skills group that's going on in the center that does provide anxiety support or other things. So I found a lot of success just bringing up the issue, empowering the client, and then helping advocate where it makes sense to really try to, to kind of clamor for what their needs are. Okay, thank you so much. So our next question is, how healthy is it for a certified peer specialist if they are in recovery working at a safe injection site? Yeah, I remember that being in the, the chat, right? And I think this is an important thing to think about. Um, one thing that we're often taught about substance use is you're in recovery forever. You know, a big tenet of AA or NA is once an addict, always an addict, right? Like we have to be aware of our own risks. Now, one thing that is part of a peer specialist training is usually they've done their own work. Now, not everyone who's gone to therapy or, or, or on MAT or gone through a 12-step program, but they've done some work to get to recovery. Usually you have to be a year or two post-use and in a rather stable spot in your life to start. Um, what often happens is your first few phases of treatment are just to get you stabilized. And then in your life, you're working on, okay, how do I manage risks? How do I manage the things that maybe are associated with use? What are the things internally I need to improve on? So that's a big part of the process. And then when peer specialists start to go into their work, they're regularly doing outreach in the community. They're going not to you know, just a, your local supermarket and putting up a table. They're going to places where people are using. So you often have to make such a, a step in gains. I know plenty of peer specialists that will go to Needle Park in Philadelphia and just be there. And that might've been their spot before. They're walking down blocks and corners. So oftentimes they need to have their own supervision and maybe their own counselor they're working with to say, I felt really triggered today. I went to a meeting because this came up. It's part of their ongoing work with peers. And that's something they can be candid about when someone's in early recovery. Like, yeah, I still get cravings from time to time, or I still have dreams. Or, you know, sometimes these areas are, are tough for me to go into because it reminds me of my past. Maybe I don't get a craving, but it, it makes me feel low because I was in a pretty sorry place at that point. Or I feel bad about some things I did at that point. But that's part of their role is to share their story and say, I've been down this road. My road maybe isn't exactly yours, but I kind of know a roadmap to get down a road. And I can share from my story and other stories I know people I've worked with and people I've lived with are, are known that have gone down this to help you. So they're trained to do this and there should be a support system where they can kind of lock in and say, hey, this work is getting a little intense for me. Let me step back. Okay, thank you so much for that clarification. So an another question is, could you speak to ideas surrounding medications like naltrexone and if they have an emergency, could opioids be used if needed for medical purposes? That is a really great question and yes. So the thing with um, naltrexone of course is it's a blocker and that at a certain level, you don't feel the opioid, but there is a point where it can be overrided. 
um, so that with, you know, if someone does to have emergency surgery and needs opioids, there's a point where it can push it through. Um, what's also helpful is we advise a number of individuals who are taking something like naltrexone or suboxone to put a card in their wallet that says, I do take this or something in their cell phone. Some people also wear, um, like when the kind of like live strong and those bands are big, we did have those that were there for that. Um, so that's one thing. So it may be up front if let's say, for example, I just had someone that had to go in for a major cancer related surgery that just started suboxone a few weeks before that. And they luckily stabilized, they were off the opioid use disorder, the opioid, um, but then they had to stop a few days before. The provider gave them some medications to help with some of the withdrawal symptoms. They went in for their surgery. They were on opioids for a few days as part of that, but their addiction specialist was involved the whole way. So then they were able to wean off. That was a planned opportunity, but we've had people that have had car accidents. Uh, provider didn't know, they realized, oh, wait a second, like they're not responding to this. And it may, they might be able to tell, um, they usually do a blood test right away. And, and sometimes they can test for these sort of specific substances if they're concerned. Uh, is there an opioid blocker that is maybe a partial like a Suboxone? Um, they may be able to call someone's provider in an emergency situation if they can figure that out. But you know, emergency rooms are well aware of this and they do respond to this. I think they, they just, they treat and if they see they're not seeing a response, especially if a person's in res unresponsive, that's a little different than someone's like, I'm in pain, oh, I'm in pain. And they can then say, hey, yes, actually, you know, I take these medications. So I'm not giving you the specifics and all the facts, but there's a lot of options with this. And also the same for pregnancy. There are options of how MAT and the different ones can be utilized for pregnancy and when there needs to be weaning off or when not. Um, there's, and especially with nursing considerations with that. So there's a whole host of things that can be done for mother and child too in those circumstances, just to, to broaden that question a little bit. Okay. Thank you. And our final question is, how do you feel about Oregon passing jurisdiction to decriminalize drugs? You know, that's a really important question. I think, I feel a lot of different ways of it. You know, I think on one end, the most important thing is a lot of times we have seen drug laws be used in ways to really inequitably that they've been used to punish certain people, often persons of color, they've gotten longer sentences. We know the crack versus cocaine discrepancy of how long people spend in jail. So these became things that just lock someone in. Um, and often, why are someone using a substance in, in a very intense way, especially the, you know, as we get into the more addictive substances, the, the harder substances, it's often as a result they cope to other things. It's not just like, I'm going to pick up a recreational habit that then becomes dependent. There are those cases, but a lot of times it's often a, a way to escape, to avoid. And therefore everything that comes with that becomes you know, part and parcel of mental health, physical health, what they're coping with. And then we're throwing a criminal charge, which then puts all these walls up for someone, blocks them sometimes from getting the care they need. So by putting a law and throwing someone in, in, in prison and giving them a, a, you know, a record for that, on one end, that becomes a problem in addition to many other problems and can make the hole even harder for someone to get out of. And we see so many overdoses happen when someone leaves a small jail stint, their tolerance is readjusted, they go back to using what they were using, and then all of a sudden they have an overdose or, or, or a fatal overdose. So there are things we want to be careful with that. However, you know, just like the marijuana legalization and decriminalization efforts across the country, I think it's still an important conversation that we need to have about what is safe and what is not safe? You know, just like I don't get on someone if they're in my office and say, I use marijuana all the time, but there's some questions I ask about that of, you know, do you always turn to it when you're stressed or sad? Um, is there a day that you can skip? What is it like when you do skip a day? How do you feel? You know, do you have to start the day or, or end the day always with smoking? It, you know, is this, I'm looking for a lot of dependency signs. So I had then talk about moderate use and, just like drinking too much alcohol or anything in excess, there can be too much. I think likewise, when we think about party drugs like Molly and NDA, if we think about heroin, cocaine, um, meth, they're, just because they're illegal doesn't mean that they're always great to use. So I think still it's important to say there's a reason why we're decriminalizing this. And part of that is due to procedures to do 
treatments like ketamine and um, psilocybin, magic mushrooms that are actually showing really good psychological benefits for certain conditions is trying to make them where they can actually prescribe some of those treatments. But we want to make sure that someone doesn't think it's carte blanche, just like we wouldn't go drink, you know, 15 beers and go drive, hopefully. Same thing with these substances. There's some risk with them. We want to be careful how we manage those. Okay. Thank you so much. And again, on behalf of the HRSA team and the entire Westchester community, I want to take you for taking I want to thank you for taking the time out to do this because this was such a really important training. And I wish we had all the time in the world for questions. So this is really appreciated. Thank you so much. Quite welcome. Thank you, everyone. And good luck out there being integrated and trying to help people where they need to be helped. Thank you.